वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम प्रोफेसर सुष्मिता बासुमा जमदार फ्रॉम द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ एंशंट इंडियन हिस्ट्री एंड कल्चर यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ कैलकटा इन द कोर्स इंडियन कल्चर सब्जेक्ट इंडियन न्यूमिसमैटिक्स टूडे विल बी टेकिंग अप द मॉड्यूल क्वान्टिफिकेशन इन न्यूमिसमैटिक्स डाई स्टडीज एंड साइंटिफिक न्यूमिसमैटिक्स Quantification is a very important issue as far as numismatics is concerned because the coins are found in large numbers either from holes or in stray evidences so these coins need to be quantified because this is money so quantification of several types are actually done and also the application of scientific analysis or statistical analysis is also very important issue in numismatics at the same time dd kosambi introduced a term called scientific numismatics so we will also learn about this issue in this course apart from this we will have application of statistical methods and we will also learn about dye studies and different terms and terminologies which are used in dye studies so these will be very basic things about dye studies and quantification and quantitative methods applied in the field of numismatics when we take a basic quantification it means a kind of a numerical monitoring so when we have a lot of coins from the hoards so the first thing which we can do is count the number of coins which have been found in that hoard so counting the number of coins actually gives us the information that these coins were actually circulating and these coins were actually minted by this ruler or by this dynasty so here we have an exact number and from this we can always say that the coins were more than this number so this is a very basic monitoring or numerical monitoring of the coins the second can be requantifying them into subgroups according to classification of the hoard then the third step which is minimum amount of coins of each type in circulation during a particular period in a particular region then again a step forward in this direction of quantification is comparative analysis of hoards of similar coins from the same region or other regions the process of numerical monitoring can be seen very easily in a very imperative work done by p l gupta and terry hardaker as we are aware that p l gupta and terry hardaker had worked on the imperial panchma coins of the early phase so they had divided these coins which do not have any inscription on them we do not know exactly which ruler had issued as these coins only had multiple symbols on them so on the obverse we have five symbols on these coins so what gupta and hardaker did was they had quantified the number of symbols and classified them according to different subgroups and groups now they could divide them chronologically into seven different series later on again this was updated and two more series was added to this whole group but this is a kind of application of statistics to the whole issue to arrange the coins in chronological order so now you know that quantification is very important and this also leads us to some kind of a scientific analysis and statistics also is very very helpful in this case This survey of panchma coins was further carried forward when Elizabeth Errington had actually analyzed the different hoard of panchma coins. So this is a different kind of an quantification altogether where she had not seen the series or each coins but she had taken all the hoards together which have been found from the Indian subcontinent and then 
classified them accordingly and she had seen the kind of movement of coins from one region to the other or the kind of coins which have been found from each region and the regional biases so this is again another step forward in the issue of quantification then we have the work of Damodar Dharmananda Kosambi who has made a major impact on the coinage or the study of Indian numismatics. Damodar Dharmananda Kosambi was basically a mathematician and he was an expert in statistical studies. So with him started a new phase in Indian numismatics and he also wrote an article named scientific numismatics so he coined the term scientific numismatics and before Kosambi what was happening was basically the documentation of coins the classification of the coins and making of catalogs of the coins so it was very important what is on the obverse of the coins and what is on the reverse of the coins for the first time Kosambi introduced a technique where he was applying science to the field of numismatics so now numismatics had become a multidisciplinary study and in this process of quantification D.D. Kosambi's contribution is remarkable. So he for the first time termed it as scientific numismatics. As Kosambi himself mentions the main purpose of a coin is not to carry a legend portrait or cult marks but to put into circulation a piece of metal cut to a standard weight. He also mentioned that every hoard of coins bears the signature of its society. So he was not looking at the coin only as a numismatic specimen but he was also placing it in the broader context of the society. He also cited modern parallels for example while pointing to the heavy debasement of Mauryan currency and relating it to the far greater pressure upon the currency he drew parallels from British India currency during the Second World War. Kusambi's approach was very logical and statistical. A statistical study of a coin group by weights was attempted by him for the first time. He selected two hoes from Taxila and took the data from Walsh's memorial. But it is very interesting that Kosambi could have taken the material only from Walsh or from some of the museums and could not have made much effort but on the contrary what he did was he weighed each and every coin himself. So he relied on his own skills and then we find that he mentioned that with the passage of time when the coin is in circulation it tends to lose weight. So according to his theory he had put time on one side and the loss of weight on the other side. So in the graph X and Y scale he had taken them together and he also mentioned that there is a term called legal remedy. So let us also now learn what is legal remedy. It's a very basic term but it is quite important because Kosambi has pointed out that there is always a factor of unavoidable weight variation even in coins newly minted using the same technique even by the same craftsman. Kosambi use the term legal remedy for such tolerance level of weight variation at the time of its minting. This legal remedy is thus different from the weight lost in the process of transaction. As I have mentioned that Kosambi was looking at the weight loss of the coin with the duration of time in which the coin had been put to circulation. He classified a set of punch mark coins by number of reverse marks. So what Kosambi was trying to say is that the number of reverse mark which are also known as control mark, shaft mark, guild mark or the mark of checking the coins. So these marks actually according to Kosambi were made by the guilds 
the shroffs and others who checked the coin time and again but this was also put by the official authority so he said the number of reverse mark if there are more the coin had been in circulation for a longer time so it's inversely proportional to the time in which the coin was in circulation so he was counting the number of reverse marks to mention that the coin had been in circulation for a long long time and for this he adopted a statistical method and he took a group of coins from takshila which were freshly minted and counted the number of reverse marks on them and in this uh, graph you can see the number of reverse marks has been put on one scale and on the other axis you have the average weight of the coins in grains and the graph goes down so there is concentration at single points so the line of regression is given by the on the y axis kosambi's theory thus was the number of reverse marks increases as the weight decreases but it's very important to mention here that where the reverse marks put at a regular intervals so kosambi suggests on the basis of the scientific analysis and on the basis of the statistical analysis and the graph that these marks were put at regular intervals of 12 years now one has to understand if the coin is put into circulation then how is it possible to bring it back after every 12 years and put a mark so it is very difficult for a coin to mention that it has completed 12 years and come back for another punch so the theory which kosambi had put forward was actually not feasible or not viable so it's very normal that a coin will lose its weight when it is in circulation for a longer time but to have punches on it in regular intervals is actually not possible now regarding the effect of circulation on weight we find that he has mentioned the application of mathematical theory of homogeneous random process to set of coins the result in three curves a familiar normal distribution curve which is also known as the gaussian curve after remaining in circulation for some time the curve of weight distribution has changed shape but is still normal the third curve is flatter and showing the variation of the weight among coins has increased so you can now see the graph which is actually the effect of circulation on the weight the scosambi concludes the decrease in the average weight and increase in the variation are each strictly proportional to the length of time the coinage has been in circulation the average weight declines regularly because the average loss of weight is same per unit of time say a year the curve becomes flatter much more rapidly because the square of standard deviation increases regularly with time so the loss of weight is inversely proportional to the time rather it depends on frequency of its use in the process of circulation because if the coin is in circulation for a longer time it will lose weight but every coin will not have the similar history so one coin minted at the same time will have more circulation whereas the other coin can just go for a saving bank so that coin is not used as the first coin so the weight of coins will vary from each other it will only depend on the circulation the differential between the actual and the ideal weight of a coin is a measure of the velocity of exchange to which the coin is subjected velocity is actually the measure of the rate of movement so this cannot be uniform for all the coins So now let us again revisit Kosambi's theory and check whether it's feasible or not. The number of the reverse mark Kosambi had mentioned that this increases and the weight decreases. This can really happen. But the thing is that the marks on the reverse cannot be put at regular intervals of 12 years as Kosambi has mentioned.
Now let us move to the loss of coins from circulation which is again a very major issue to which again Kosambi had attracted our attention. In the absence of the mint records, in case of the ancient Indian coins, the estimation of coins in circulation becomes quite difficult. The quantity estimates from survival patterns is actually known as calculating the half-life of coins and this has been done by several scholars and it has been applied to numismatics by several scholars like Cole and recently even John Dell has done the same thing that is calculating of half-life of coins. Patterson and Dell and Cole are the major proponents of these theories who have applied it to the Indian numismatics. And the methodology which has been used by Cole, who has mentioned it as lifetime of coins in circulation, are based on nine surveys which he had carried. Large sample of coins of same denomination drawing from banks, local banks and frequencies of each date occurring were recorded. This can also be mentioned as absorption of coins. Coins of a group tend to disappear from circulation in a regular way that is proportional to the number circulating. So suddenly we will have the drop in the number of coins which is in the market. So whenever there are fresh coins in the market, there is a tendency to hold a few or keep the new coins with you. So when this happens, there is a sudden drop in the number of coinage which has come to the circulation and this is known as absorption of coin and when the number of coin reduces to half this time period is known as half-life of coin the rate of absorption is represented by a statistical law in familiar geometric progression here you can see Kosambi's description where he has used the number of punch marks on the coins and also the the loss of weight of the coins to show the absorption in the square coins as kosambi mentions the rate of absorption is similar to the law of absorption of radiation the law of healing rate of wounds and the law of growth by compound interest so how do we actually calculate we will calculate the absorption of coins in the same way as we calculate all these so it's a common theory which has been applied here john esdell and patterson have also applied this absorption of coin theory as i have already mentioned let us see how they have applied it and to which set of coins have they applied and is it universal or it varies from coin to coin it really does because it also depends on the kind of circulation which is happening the kind of remnants which we are having the rate of absorption or diminution of the quantity of coins in circulation is measured by the half-life of coins the time taken for the survivors to be reduced to half their original numbers is termed as half-life Patterson has estimated the half-life of silver coins in circulation in the 20th century at 25 to 30 years. So it takes 25 to 30 years for the coins to become half the number of coins that had been actually put into circulation. If we put 100 coins to circulation to become 50 like when we have 50 coins in the market, it takes 25 to 30 years according to Patterson and Ted. For the medieval period in Europe, he proposed a half-life of 50 to 100 years. As I have suggested that from area to area, from region to region and from the kind of usage of coin, it will vary. So in medieval Europe, the time taken is 50 to 100 years. Dale estimated a half-life of approximately 20 years for the Rajput bull and horseman coinage of Delhi. So we have seen that these are in three different forms. So one has to be very careful while calculating it, but the application of statistical method actually helps in estimating the half-life of coins. As I had already mentioned that Kosambi's methodologies 
have actually made a major change in Indian numismatics and the application of science or scientific numismatics had made a major impact on the Indian numismatic studies. So Kosambi was the first person to calculate the half-life of coins and it still continues with the studies of Patterson, Cole and also John S. Dell. So this is one of the methods which is still in application though the rest of the uh, things on the theories which Kosambi had put forward were at fault but still we cannot underestimate the efforts of Kosambi because he actually had made a major paradigm shift from what had been happening in Indian numismatics. Now from here let us move to the topic of dye studies and dye analysis. Let us take up the terms and terminologies. Dye is actually the tool which is used for minting die struck coins. We have two dies. One is called the obverse die and the other is called the reverse die. The reverse die is actually kept on the anvil and then the coin blank is kept on it and then the obverse die and finally a metal protector and then the hammer blow is received by the whole set and the coin is then minted. But this is a basic definition of minting. But where as far as die studies are concerned, the obverse and the reverse dies are two different things. So let us now learn the basics of die studies and terminologies. According to die studies, the definition of an obverse die is the die which is fixed on the anvil on which the coin blank is placed is actually the obverse die. So this die which is actually kept on the anvil and fixed to it is the obverse die. So the term obverse means which is more important the primary die. So this is the die which is to be protected. So it is not receiving the direct hammer blow on this the coin blank will be kept and the reverse die will be the opposed die to the obverse die which will receive the hammer blow and not directly because it will have a metal protector now what exactly is die analysis and how it helps numismatists for further analysis and how it helps in reconstruction of the history let us learn a little more about it the technique and methodologies used for examining dyes through the coins they produced is known as dye analysis. Now it is very important to know that we have not found many dyes in excavations or explorations. The reason being that if a dye is in wrong hands or in the hands of the counterfeiters then they can make forced or fake currency in large numbers. So immediately when the die was discarded or when the decision was taken to seize the production, the die was immediately destroyed. And since the die was destroyed, we do not find them in explorations and excavations. So how do we do die studies when we don't have the dies? So it is the coins which are actually produced with the dies. They are studied very carefully and by a careful examination, now we can say that how many dies were actually used to mint these coins. So the number of dies can be estimated from the coins which have been produced from these dies. Now the second term is die combination. What does it mean? A particular combination of obverse and reverse dies known to occur on one or more coins is called a die combination. Die group. A group of dies involving multiple obverses and reverses in which a die link or series of die links connects all the dies is called a die group. So when we get a die group, they are all interconnected. So the connectivity becomes very, very important. Now let us also learn about discontinuous production. 
a system of production in which the mint destroys the dyes after the period of work is called discontinuous production. As I have already mentioned, the, the dyes were destroyed. So, when the mint destroys the dye, it is called discontinuous production because now there is a discontinuity in the production process. Double striking or double struck. A coin which is moved during the striking resulting in the image to appear in two or more times on the coin is called double striking. So we know that on the lower die or on the alveol die the coin blank is kept and then the upper die or the reverse die is kept. So while striking one of the things can move either the upper die moves that is the reverse die or the coin blank can move a little and when this happens or even the hammer blow is not correct so we have to mint it again so when the coin receives another blow then we get a double image this is actually known as double striking or double struck then in die analysis there are very important terms like intra-die analysis and inter-die analysis. This is the most important part of die study. What do we mean by intra-die analysis? The study of how a particular die wore out and was altered by examining multiple coins produced by the same tie is known as intra-dye analysis. So when we have a set of coins which have been minted by the same dye, then we can examine them carefully and see what are the variations which are happening. So a small crack can develop while minting the coin. So we see that the crack is gradually becoming deeper and larger and then the crack is actually mended a little and then some coins are struck and then gradually the die is breaking so we can arrange them e accordingly and this is known as the internal study of the die is known as intra die analysis and inter die analysis is just the opposite uh, the study of relationships between different die by examining the different die combinations they occur in is called inter die analysis for doing inter die analysis we need a larger set of coins and we have to examine the relationships between different dies if they come in different combinations then there is a very important term called isolated die. An obverse and reverse die which is found in more than one die combination but in which the opposed dies are not found in other die combinations is known as isolated die. Once again the obverse and the reverse die which is found in more than one die combination but in this the opposed die is not found in other die combinations is known as an isolated die. Then meta die analysis. It's a statistical analysis of the dies in a given sample. So whenever there is an application of statistical analysis in die studies it's called meta die analysis. And then singleton. A die combination in which both the dies are not known in any other die combination is known as a singleton. So both the dies that is the obverse and the reverse die are not known from any other die combination will be known as a singleton. Now let us learn a little about the historiography of die studies. This was first introduced by Imhoff Blumer, who was a German scholar. And the, all the writings of Imhoff Blumer were in German. So the others who could not read German, to them it was not becoming much popular. So it was Neville who for the first time translated them and applied it to uh, another set of coins and he wrote in English. So with the writings of Neville then the uh, die studies were actually introduced to the rest of the part 
of Europe and it became very very popular and they were again uh, applied to Greek numismatics and the Hellenic coinages and with this started the major trend of doing dye analysis from 1921 onwards. So from 1912 to 21 we find that it was applied on the coins of Alexander and his Hellenistic successors and this gave a major impetus to dye studies. The critics actually felt that the labor which has been put is not uh, worth it actually because it's too much difficult and it's time taking and the results which are produced by this dye analysis are not worth spending that much of time but with time there was a major change again and dye studies became very very popular from 1950 to 1970. This period can be said as the period of modern dye studies and development of new techniques started dye charts were being prepared, statistics was applied and estimating the number of coins produced by a dye was actually proposed. And here we can mention the name of three very important scholars, the work by Buttery, Cole and Crawford were very very important and imperative and they actually tried to estimate the number of coins which were minted by a dye. So, by doing dye analysis, they also tried to estimate how many coins a dye can produce and then they multiplied it with the number of dyes which have been found. Now we will come to this issue a little later and see whether the feasibility of quantification by studying dye analysis is possible or not. Dye population and coin population vary from type to type. Every dye has its own specific identity. Metal used for preparing the dyes are not the same in every case and the life of the dye or the production capacity of each dye hence differs. Use of probability statistics can lead to faulty conclusions in this case. Now let me explain a little about it. If the dye capacity is imagined as 5000 per dye, it is not necessary that that dye will be used for minting 5000 coins. It means that the dye has the capacity to mint 5000 coins. But this does not mean that the dye has produced 5000 coins because production of coins actually depends on several other things. It actually depends on the economic factors, whether there is a need for minting such coins or not. Secondly, it can also depend on the rulers who will decide whether you really need that amount of coins or not. It can also depend on the mint which will decide whether they have to change that die or not. It can also depend on the change of a design of the coin or the device of the coin which which the die has been changed. So the production will depend on several other factors though the die has the capacity but it can be discarded from use or it can be kept aside and again it can be reused a little later. So it can be kept in a mint box for a long time and again reused. But it does not mean the capacity and the production have to go hand in hand. Number of coins a die can produce prior to its rejection depends on these factors. Again reiterating it number one it is dye material or the metal used so we have to see whether the dye has been minted properly or whether the dye has been made properly whether the tampering has been done nicely whether it is ample ductile whether it can receive the hammer blow it can happen that one dye after producing 10 or 50 coins develops a big crack and it has been discarded so every dye which will be made cannot have the same capacity so it will depend on the kind of production of the dye. Secondly, the method of production is very, very important. As I have mentioned, you have to control temperature, ductility, hardness, the diameter of the dye, and all these will have an impact on the longevity of the dye. The nature of hammering and the die position is also very very important. If the hammering is very hard, then it will get the dye damaged or 
it can also happen that the reverse die will get damaged faster than the obverse die because it receives the hammered blow more frequently than the obverse die which is on the anvil so the die position is also very important to understand how many coins the die can produce so the reverse die obviously will get corroded faster or will be discarded faster than the obverse die. Quantifying the production on the basis of assumption and applying it universally can really be dangerous. So die studies are very very important for several factors other than quantification. Now let us see what Bob Drives mentioned about the Parthian coins. He mentions after a statistical analysis that it is interesting to speculate but futile to determine the actual total number of coins minted during the entire Parthian Empire. The Roman mints had the ability to produce about 400,000 denarii per month per mint and that their dies lasted anywhere from 10,000 to 50,000 coins. If we assume that three mints produce 400,000 coins per month and the other secondary mints about six, the number of mints are six for all practicality, produced about 100,000 coins each per month, then we could have a total mint production of about 6 million each year. For the total coins, we reach a total of about 7 billion coins. So the whole thing is not practical. So what Bob Price was trying to say is that it is very futile to speculate. So the focus should be on or the ultimate aim of the quantification is to deduce an inference that can be used by the historians as a reliable assumption, if not a conclusion. Estimating the volumes of money or a particular type of coin in circulation during a particular period is the prime concern of this method. So die studies for quantifying money is not viable or it's not recommended. The prerequisites for the application of statistical methods is a very important issue. Coins must be minted accurately and should show only slight initial variation in weight. Problem with base metal currency. So the currency which we are actually examining should be the higher valuation currency like gold or silver. Circulation of coins must have been normal enough to have proper effect. So the circulation pattern has to be uniform and one has to ensure that the coins had a normal circulation. Gold coins to be excluded as they are often hoarded. So in the first point we had mentioned that they cannot be base metal currency. In the second point we are mentioning that gold coins to be excluded. So this is actually making our premise very very small. Lastly, the sample should have large number of coins with comparable history. So the parameters which one has to meet while application of statistics are very very significant and very very imperative. Preferably the coin should be from a single hoard, should be well preserved and free from encastation. Now, what we have learned till now, let us summarize it. And before summarizing, let me again reiterate that Didi Kosambi was the person who introduced the term scientific numismatics. And by scientific numismatics, he actually wanted to say that the application of different methods of science to the field of numismatics can actually help us to deduce different results. And he just wanted to apply multidisciplinary approach to the field of numismatics. Though many of the theories which he had put are not applicable and are not viable, but still Kosambi's contribution to the field of Indian numismatics is very significant. The use of quantitative methods in numismatics is very important. It requires multidisciplinary approach Kosambi opened new vistas by application of science and statistics to Indian numismatics. 
Quantifying production rate in the absence of mint records can be dangerous and futile and has to be done with much care and caution. Dye studies, which we have learned a little, an overview, are otherwise highly helpful for numismatic studies, but quantifying on the basis of dye studies can be dangerous. So, thank you for learning this course with me. Do visit EPG Patshala. Thank you.